All right, gang, welcome. Today's video is going to be on a subject that I see posted very, very frequently in most astrophotography slash astronomy slash telescope group I belong to. And if you belong to any such groups, I know you've seen this too as well. And that is the question, why can't I achieve focus? Whether that's with an eyepiece or with a camera. Very common question. And if you, like me, have probably typed a, a quick answer. Hey, try this real quick. But you know the real answer is fairly lengthy because it involves a series of steps. And if step one isn't successful, then we move to step two and then on to step X until we finally achieve focus. By the way, if it sounds like I'm a little bit under the weather, it's because I am. But I wanted to go ahead and knock this video out because I'm going to take this cough drop out. I'm sorry. Because like I said... We see this posted often. And for those of us that have been in the hobby for a while and there's folks new to the hobby, we don't want them to get frustrated. And if you're watching this, you're new to the hobby, I don't want you to get frustrated. I don't want you to quit. I don't want you to put your telescope back on Facebook market. I don't want you to get discouraged. And I want you to be able to, I mean, what a great hobby, whether you're just visual or astrophotography, if you have a complicated go-to mount that does tracking or auto guiding, or if you have a push to, it doesn't matter. Wonderful hobby, lots of fun, and I want everybody to enjoy it. So, like I've said before, this is, on other videos, this is to answer a very common question, but I am not a fan of sitting down and typing at a keyboard. And then having to do it all over again, you know, a week and a half later when I see the question posted again. So that's the purpose of this video. And it's cold outside, a little windy, it's snowing, it's the new year. And I've got hot chocolate here, so I'm glad you're with me, and thanks for joining. If you're new here, welcome. If you've been here before, uh, welcome back. So why can't I achieve focus? That's what we're going to talk about. But let's talk about a few definitions, and I think it's important. And I, I have to understand things in very simplistic terms, no matter how complex the subject may be. And so... When I explain things, I also, and if you've watched my videos before, you know that I put things in very easy to understand terms because if I don't, then I won't even understand what the hell I'm talking about. So I think it's important before we talk about focus and why can't I achieve focus and more importantly, how do I achieve focus? I think it's important that we talk about some optics slash physics related things uh, and talk a little bit about some definitions and what's going on inside our telescope. So the first thing we're going to talk about is focal point. And the reason why I think it's important to cover these definitions is as you learn more about the hobby and your telescope or astrophotography, and as you take these techniques, hopefully you'll learn in this video, outside your telescope and begin to put some of them into action, you'll understand what's happening with regards to these definitions. And then that will help you solve other problems on down the line and or help you... Um, help somebody else in the future, right? Pass it forward, like they say. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about focal point. So if we have a mirror, and that mirror could be parabolic or spherical, ideally in a mathematical sense, if it's parabolic, what I'm going to tell you here holds absolute true. Spherical mirror partially holds true, and I'm not going to talk about the difference between those two. You can look them up. But a focal point is such. If I have rays that are parallel to one another, coming down the tube of my telescope, or maybe I've got a freestanding mirror or something like that, this parabolic mirror is going to focus those rays to where they're converging, which means they're coming closer and closer and closer together. And the point that all of those rays meet to form a single point, a very bright single point of light, that is called, oops, focal point. I almost wrote just F, FP. That is the focal point. And every mirror and every lens, I could have a lens too. And again, like I've said in other videos, we're not going to win any awards for artistry here. But if I have light rays coming through here and they're refracted by this convex lens, much like a magnifying glass that we all used to go out and burn ants with when we were kids. Did I say that? Is that allowable here? Well, where the lights that pass through the lens converge, the light rays pass through and converge, that's also a focal point. So I can have a focal point not only for a mirror, but also to a convex lens. And what kind of lens is this? It's convex and you'll find it as the objective lens and just about every type of refractor out there. I, and this is a 
convex lens, I could have a concave lens that looks something like this, kind of an hourglass shape. And light rays that hit a concave lens actually are forced to diverge from each other. But if I was looking with my eyeball here, and that's a stupid picture of a human eye, if I were to project these rays to the other side of that lens, they would appear to meet at a point on the other side of the lens, and that is also the focal point. So it doesn't have to be a mirror or a convex lens. A concave lens could have a focal point too as well. So, and when will you see this? Well, in refractor telescopes that you hear the term doublet or triplet, it's counting the number, the number of pieces of glass in there. A good old 1980s Tasco refractor is going to have an objective lens up front. It's going to be a single uh, convex lens, and that's all you get. A doublet's going to have a convex lens with a concave lens next to it to correct for some weird things that happen when light travels through lenses. When light travels through glass, it refracts. However, different wavelengths refract differently, so I end up with some weird what's called aberrations, chromatic and chromatic aberration to be specific. So I have to put a secondary piece of glass here to kind of fix some of that. And in refractors and where you hear the term triplet, I've got three pieces of glass in here. And obviously the glass is coated. It's uh, also made with fluoride or fluorine. I can't remember, I think fluorine in the glass to make it more dense so we can make the light refract in every, uh, even more and that makes the glass very expensive, which is why your high-end doublets and triplets are fairly expensive. But the point is, that is what a focal point is. Focal length is the distance from my mirror to the focal point, and we call that focal length, or FL. And of course, it's from my convex lens to my focal point. That is the focal length. For our concave lens like that. Remember the focal points on the other side of the lens. So it actually has a negative focal length. So yes, you can have negative focal lengths and all that negative sign is it implies which side of the lens the focal point exists. Much like on a, a number line, a negative sign simply implies what side of the zero we're talking about on that number line, if that all makes sense. So that's focal point and that is focal length. And these things are all gonna come into play when we talk about why can't I achieve focus. There's another term out there called focal ratio. Focal ratio. Now it's ratio, which implies it's a fraction, which means we got some number over another number. And in focal ratio, what we're talking about is the focal length divided by the aperture or the diameter of your objective lens or your mirror, whichever the case may be. And almost always, in fact, I can't think of an instance where it's not the case, your mirror's diameter or lens diameter is going to be smaller than the focal length. So we could put mirror diameter or something like that. That is your focal ratio, and you'll oftentimes see it denoted as a lowercase f or an fr. And these always end up being like 4.5. Sometimes you'll see a 9.0 like some Schmidt Cassegrains. You can knock that down to a 2.0 using a Schmidt Cassegrain with a hyperstar because you're taking the secondary mirror out of the equation. But that's what that is. And the smaller the focal ratio, the faster the scope, the more light gathering capability it has. And that's for another video down the line. But those are our basic... Uh, definitions and, and what we want to talk about. There's another important one, and I'm going to draw the diagram a little bit bigger. And going forward, I'm going to use predominantly a diagram of a mirror. I'm not going to draw a mirror and a lens every time I'm talking about this, unless there's a specific need to do so. So I'm going to draw my mirror a little bit bigger. Here's where the light rays converge at the focal point. Now, what happens if we were to take my camera sensor and set it right there at the focal point? What kind of picture would we have? You got it. It would be a bright dot. There is no uh, nebulosity. There is no bird sitting on a tree branch. Whatever it is you're taking a, a picture of with your, with your telescope. Why? Because all light rays are being converged to this point, and that point's going to show up on your sensor as a bright point. That's it. 
So there exists another point, no pun intended, uh, along this light cone. And this is a term that's often used called light cone or optic train is another term called a focal plane. P-L-A-N-E. And if you remember geometry, we talked about planes and coplanar and intersecting planes, etc. <clears throat> and there's another one over here on this side of the focal point too, we'll talk about later. But what is a focal plane? It is the point, and let me just draw an easy way to understand it is to look at this. Suppose we got a picture of a guy or a lady in a, in a dress or a guy in a suit. It doesn't matter. And suppose there's a, a button or something very, very small, even a thread, I don't know. And here's our mirror. Now, there's light rays bouncing off this button and traveling in every direction. Some aren't even hitting the mirror or going down the tube of our telescope. And this could be the beak of a bird or its little bitty beady eyes. I mean, it, but obviously we want to talk about something small. And in theory, it could be a star out at infinity. But it's something small. And so there are light rays bouncing off this thing, but there's one light ray that's going to catch the very edge. And I didn't draw that well. Let me redo it. The edge of our mirror. And of course, there's going to be light rays all coming off that thing intersecting our mirror. And then, of course, down here, there will be some that miss. So there's a point at which, again, no pun intended, that every light ray that comes off this button and hits the mirror at, in theory, an infinite number of places, they will all come to focus at a point on a focal plane or an image plane. And at that focal plane is our image of the button. And there's another button here because remember it's a suit and it's going to have rays of light too bouncing everywhere. But all the rays bouncing off that button that strike our mirror are now going to be focused down here on another point. And so is the person's nose and their top hat and their shiny, shiny shoes, whatever it is that we have in the field of view. <clears throat> now, of course, this assumes something close, if you will. And of course, all the rays from everything are all going to do what? Show up at the focal point back here. Now, what's interesting is the following, and I think this is very important. Let's erase our real human being and just leave the image of our buttons right here. There exists a focal plane for objects that are real world in a given plane. So in other words, this focal plane for the buttons only exists at this location because all these buttons are in the same plane. But if we go 500 feet back and there's a taxi cab at an intersection, that taxi cab's focal plane is going to be somewhere else along here. So if I have a camera sensor and I'm moving it back and forth along this optic cone with my focuser knob, and all of a sudden my, and I want to take a picture of the buttons, all of a sudden my camera sensor is right here at the focal plane for the buttons. What is the taxi cab going to look like in the background? it's going to be out of focus because that taxi cab's focal plane is in another position. It's very interesting, which is why when you take pictures of things at a given range and they're in focus, it could be your sweetheart at the park or your significant other, whatever, holding some flowers. But in the background, the nice green, pretty trees are what? Out of focus. And if there's anything in the foreground, like some people set up pictures like that, where like a little rose bush cuts across their chin, or you know what I'm talking about, those things may be slightly out of focus because the rose bush in the foreground and the pretty trees in the background all have their own different focal planes. And focal plane and image plane are two different terms. Now, they're two different terms, but they're used synonymously. Hey guys, I'm interjecting this into the middle of this video because I think it's something important. Uh, to bring up, and it's not necessarily something that has directly related to the question, why can't I achieve focus? But since we're talking about image plane and focal plane, I wanted to mention this. A lot of my drawings that I've done so far in this video has shown the focal plane for your telescope, whether you're using a mirror or a refractor, 
a lens. I've drawn it as a vertical plane like this. But I wanted to make sure you understood that in reality, the focal plane is slightly curved. It's a curved plane. So it's, if that, in fact, in fact, that's a a curved plane. It doesn't even make sense. It's a curved field, if you will. But we still call it the focal plane and the image plane. But it's just not a flat plane, if that makes sense in a geometric sense. Which is why if you have something that, let me perfectly center this, object here if you have a light ray or a star or something perfectly centered in your field of view it will be in focus but you notice in your imagery if you have any stars near the edge of your field of view um, towards the edge of the sensor because remember your sensor is flat so whatever's in the middle of your field of view will be in focus because it's striking the curved the curved image plane formed by your telescope in the middle. So for sure, you're definitely in focus here and you're gonna be in focus here. But anything that strikes the sensor, I'm gonna duplicate this arrow. So anything that strikes the center off, I'm sorry, the sensor off center won't be in focus. You see how these two arrows are different? Now it's in focus on this curved focal plane, but it's going to be out of focus on your flat sensor because the sensor in your camera obviously is flat and the focal plane uh, formed by the optics in your telescope are curved. And that's why a lot of times you'll see online what's called a field flattener. And it's uh, much like a Barlow, but it's got some glass in it. And what it does is instead of this image plane or this focal plane now being curved after the light passes through it on this side, it'll be on this side. After this light passes through it, I'm running PowerPoint here. It'll straighten out these rays so that they all meet at a plane, a flat plane right here. At the same time, a lot of times a Folk, a uh, field flattener also serves to be a focal reducer. It shortens the focal length of the telescope. So I wanted to just talk about that. Let me drag this into the uh, recording here a little bit quicker. So this field flattener turns, turns a curved field, image field, an image plane, a focal plane, if you will, into a flat plane so that everything on your sensor which of course is flat, is now in focus. I want to make sure that was clear and I wanted to interject this. Again, not that it's directly related to the subject we're talking about, but if you were to, you know, you may be wondering, well, how does all this tie into this thing that I hear about field flatteners, et cetera? Well, that's what this is. So I wanted to uh, throw this in here. Thanks. So I think focal plane is a very important definition for you to understand. So where it's always, it's kind of a misnomer that whenever we try to focus with our camera we're trying to put that camera sensor at the focal point and that is not what's happening what you're wanting to do is put your camera at the focal plane for that object in which you're trying to image a little sip of hot chocolate there now there comes a point in time where if i have something that's a mile away it's going to have a given focal plane and if i have something that's two miles away Mathematically, the focal plane will be a little bit different, but in terms of a physical position somewhere on the light cone, it's almost imperceptible. And if I have a star, if I were to image Alpha Centauri at 4.3 light years, and then turn around and slew to Vega at 26 light years, they are significantly, one is six times further away than the other. Do you think the focal plane for those two are really different in reality in terms of a position along the light cone? No. That's why once I achieve, you achieve, focus on a focused star and then slew your scope over to M42, the Orion Nebula, everything's still in focus, even though the distances may be significantly different, right? Orion Nebula, about 1,500 light years. Vega, 26 light years. Big difference in range, but yet it's still a pretty much the same focal plane. And I think those concepts are very important to understand when we're trying to achieve focus. Because I want, when, as you're moving your focus or in and out and playing around with the lens and the camera, I want you to be able to understand what's happening 
in a physics standpoint, optics standpoint, in relation to what's physically going on with your camera and or eyepiece. So that's why we talked about that. That's why we talked about the light cone and the optic train. Let's cover a quick subtopic, if you will, real quick. And this is something that you see uh, often posted with these issues regarding focus. Hey, I put in my eyepiece. I see the target. It looks great. Very clear. <coughs> Excuse me. I swap it out, throw my camera in completely out of focus. I rack the focuser all the way in, rack the focuser all the way out. I still can't achieve focus. What's going on? Here's what's happening. Remember, your light cone does this, and that's a terrible... Let's just do this. To the focal point. But your eyepiece, I'm drawing all these exaggerated, I know. Your eyepiece right here with pieces of glass in it. And then here's some eye relief if you've got that. And of course, here's your, uh, again, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad I don't earn a living drawing because I would, my, my family and I would starve to death. But here's the eye. That eyepiece has optics in there. There's pieces of glass that are designed to refract light such that it exits the eyepiece and the engineers and designers of this eyepiece know that we're not done when that light exits the eyepiece. It still has to go through what? Your cornea, which is denser than the air that you're breathing, which means the light is going to do what? Refract. And then it goes from the cornea into your lens, and the lens is going to change position, right? And then it's going to go from the lens to your vitreous humor, which is the clear fluid inside the eyeball. All of these things have different densities, and as light goes from one medium of a different density to a medium of another density, it does what? It refracts. So the engineers know that so that in the end, we form an image back on your retina. So these eyepieces are designed for that. And depending upon what eyepiece I have and the different style and make and quality of the eyepiece, that eyepiece may, may need to be positioned at different positions along this light cone in order to achieve focus on your retina. Not at the eyepiece exit, but on your retina. Which explains why sometimes I can look through an eyepiece and have a beautiful picture. I take my eye away, I put my camera on top of the eyepiece and I see something that looks terrible. Or I have to move this around it to achieve focus for that camera. That explains what's happening there. And remember, the focal point isn't allowed to even form when you throw an eyepiece in there. Because that eyepiece is going to grab the light rays before they converge. And like I said, there, and it's going to do weird things with the light. It's going to maybe cross over and then straighten out. And typically it's going to maybe have a slight expanding, slight divergent path leaving the eyepiece until it enters your eye. And then, of course, it does all kinds of strange things in your eye like we talked about. But when I take this eyepiece away, now there's nothing in my focus tube. There's my light rays converging to the focal point. And now I throw in a camera sensor. There's my camera sensor, an array of pixels that make up my camera sensor. Well, remember we talked about, and then by the way, I'm looking out at infinity. Maybe I'm looking at M42. And M42 has a specific focal plane. And for, and for that matter, everything out at infinity has a specific focal plane. And it's mathematically slightly different, but for all practical purposes, from a physical sense, it's the same. So notice our camera sensor is not coplanar. In other words, in the same position as the focal plane. So what's the image going to look like over here? It's going to be out of focus. So we have to rack our focus. So that means turn the knob, turn our knob, turn our knob, turn our knob. And then boom, we reach the stops. The closest I can get, the furthest down I can get my focus tube is here. That's our sensor. And now notice the sensor is not coplanar with the focal plane. So what is going to happen to that image on our sensor when we take a picture? It'll be out of focus. So we try it a dozen times. It doesn't work. We get mad. We take off the camera, put the eyepiece back on. And what does it look like? It looks good. You know, we focus and, and then we go back and forth from camera to eyepiece, eyepiece to camera. Wondering why does it look just fine in an eyepiece, but doesn't look good in a camera. And that's what's going on. 
the design of your telescope doesn't allow for that particular camera to get the image, I'm sorry, the sensor all the way down to the image plane or focal plane, whatever term you want to use. So how can we do that? Well, your focuser is a device strapped onto the side of your telescope and it's got a tube that goes into the OTA optical tube assembly. And this is where you would put your camera or your eyepiece in here. And let's just suppose our sensor is right here. And here is the focal plane for anything out at infinity. So, and here's our little knob, right? So we turn it, turn it, turn it. And just like I showed you earlier, boom, it stops short. So how can I fix that? Well, there's a couple ways, and one of them we're going to talk about when we get over to the telescope, because I'm actually going to bring up a telescope in this discussion and show you that. But one of the ways we can do it, there's a, there, we can move the mirror, we can shorten the OTA, which is a sense the same thing as moving the mirror, uh, or we can get a low-profile focuser. And that's what I want to talk about in this drawing. So what we do is we totally take this focuser off, and we get a low-profile focuser, and all that means is it just sits further deep into the OTA so that when I rack this thing all the way down into the tube, it goes way down in there so that my sensor can be moved to be coplanar with the image plane or focal plane for whatever that is out at infinity. And what's interesting, this whole infinity distance thing, we know this to be true. Take your camera and look at something out at infinity. Pick Vega. Nice, crisp diffraction lines. You can tell it's in focus. Then put away your telescope. Don't change any of this. Just put away your telescope. Next day, get up, bring it out. Point it to a line of trees or a telephone pole or cell phone tower that's a, a mile away or a half mile away. And guess what? Because it's much, much closer, its image plane or focal plane is going to be completely different. And when you try to take a picture of it, through the camera, from the settings from the previous night, you'll find out what the image is out of focus because the sensor is no longer in the focal plane for that object that you're looking at that's much closer. And again, I'm under the weather, you can tell. <coughs> Excuse me, getting a little hoarse. But this is why one of the solutions is to get a low profile focuser. So now, and I'm, I actually go ahead, I'll go ahead and talk about this now before we talk about, uh, before we go over to the telescope. One of the answers you'll see, now I'm going to draw a Newtonian telescope, a reflector. And here's our tube, our optical tube assembly. Here's our mirror. But what do we have here? We have what's called a secondary mirror or a diagonal. And it's held in place by spider veins. And of course, we have a hole in the side of our OTA for our focuser, right there. And the light comes down here. Normally the light cone would do what? It would extend out here, just like the, so, until it reached the foca, focal uh, point. But because this diagonal is there, or that secondary, the cone is bent at 90 degrees. Um, I probably didn't even do that right. Let's do it this way. If we're gonna draw something from a physics standpoint, let's do it optically correct. Still looks like crap. <laughs> but the point is, you understand what I'm saying. Our light cone is being bent at 90 degrees to exit the side of the tube, which is awesome. That, by the way, there's some telescopes that come all the way up here, and your camera or your eyepiece, whatever you want to use, is up here. And of course, you have a Schmidt Cassegrain, which bounces it back and forth, etc. But notice we've taken the focal point, moved it from here to here. Focal length is still the same. We take that length plus this length. None of that has changed. We've simply just changed its position by 90 degrees. Same with the focal plane for whatever it is we're imaging, something up close or something out at infinity. What's interesting is this. Not only do these light rays converge at a single point called a focal point, but once they reach that point, they don't stop. Now they diverge, they spread out. And it just so happens there's also a focal plane on this side of the focal point. And the same holds true for a convex lens. Here comes our light, it's refracted to a focal point. And guess what? Then we have diverging light rays. If you've ever taken a magnifying glass, which is predominantly a convex lens, and try to 
do a nice little, like catch a match on fire, a piece of paper. When you first start off, the, the ring of light is what? That big. And as you bring the telescope out, the ring's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That tells you you're, you've got the ground or your match or whatever you're trying to catch on fire. I won't say ants. On this side of the focal point. Because the further you move the lens away, this area is getting larger and larger and larger. Makes sense, doesn't it? So then you realize, oh no, go the other way. Now you move the magnifying closer to your target, your match or your piece of paper or your ant. And now the, the circle of light is getting smaller and smaller and smaller until it's a single point. What you're doing is you're moving the focal point all the way against the match or whatever it is you're trying to, to burn. And if you go too far, the light does what? Goes from a point back to a, a large disc again. And now you've gotten on this side of the focal point. So conversely over here, you have an image plane prior to the focal point, but you have an identical image plane on the other side of the focal point. And the distance between the image plane or focal plane, whatever you want to call it, and the focal point on each side is the same. And for any given distance away that your target exists, there exists, like I talked about, a different focal plane. So a tree branch at half a mile is going to have a different focal plane than a, a mountain at 10 miles. And that focal plane is going to exist equally on each side of the focal points. It's symmetric. It's going to be a mirror image. And the other thing that's interesting, and I know you've seen this before, is that anything looked at with the eye or imaged on this side of the focal point will be what? Inverted. Inverted. Yeah, I spelled it right. Whereas anything on this side will appear correct. So if you look through your telescope, take a picture, or look at it through an eyepiece, most likely you are looking at the focal plane, or at least your eyepiece is existing on this side of the focal point, where up is down, down is up, right is left, and left is right. You see this all the time with the moon. You know, there are craters on the moon that clearly are in the northern hemisphere, but when you take a picture of the moon, they appear in the southern hemisphere. It's because your image plane for that particular camera that you're using and for that particular target range, i.e. the moon, has a focal plane on this side. If you could physically take your camera, shove it through the OTA and put the sensor from here to here, then take a picture, you'd find that everything is normal and not inverted. So a lot of definitions and a lot of things I think to discuss, but like I talked about earlier, I, thought, I think those things are very important. And I, I am not a fan of using a piece of equipment and not knowing how it works or to have a solution to a problem and not know what's happening behind the scenes uh, such that that solution is working for me. So I thought these definitions, these diagrams, and the relationship between focal point, focal length, focal slash image plane, light cone, all of that was relevant to the question, why can't I achieve focus? So what I'm going to do now is pause for a second. We're going to jump over to the telescope and take a look at that. All right, folks, welcome back. We are now at the telescope itself where we can take some of the stuff that we talked about on the dry erase board and on the whiteboard there and actually put it to practical use, if you will, on the telescope. Now, normally, let me just say, I normally have the ZWO AEF electronic automatic focuser mounted to this. I've taken it off and I hate doing that, but just know that I've done it for you. That's how special you are to me. So that what? So we can turn this thing freely because with that thing attached, you can't do so. So totally disassembled or took that thing off. I'm going to rack the focuser all the way in and we'll start our discussion from there, from that position. Then I've got some other things just around here that we're going to talk about uh, <coughs> and blend it in to the discussion. Again, I'm under the weather. I apologize. This is an Orion 8-inch astrograph. So what's the difference between an 8-inch daub? Well, obviously the daub is the type of mount, but it's a, it's a Newtonian, right? It's on a special Dobson mount. But this is an 8-inch astrograph. The mirror is the same size, but what do you notice versus an 8-inch daub? The tube is a lot shorter. Astrograph implies that it was designed to take imagery. And so they've shortened the tube significantly. But the mirror is an 8-inch mirror, and the focal point of the mirror is the same. The focal length is the same as your typical daub. They didn't change mirrors, but because the tube is shorter, 
what did they do with the focal point? The focal point moves out here. So for every inch that the tube is shorter or that we've, in other words, moved the mirror up, we've moved the focal point that same equal amount of distance forward. Now remember, we've got that 90 degree diagonal, that secondary mirror in here. So really our focal point is doing what? It's coming up through the focus tube. Let's go ahead and pop that thing out right now. And it exists right here. Some telescopes, it exists down in there. Some telescopes, it's way up in here. The designers of this tube knew that most of the people using this are going to use it for imaging, right? Taking photographs. So they need to make sure that the focal plane, wherever it exists in and around this area, somewhere in this range, why isn't, a, isn't it a fixed distance? Because it depends on the range of the target. Now, granted, with a telescope like this, most people are going to be doing astrophotography, so that means the range is going to be out at infinity, which just mathematically means that the focal point plane is going to be the same, but it's going to be somewhere in this area right here. Now, every camera I put in here may have a different distance from the edge of the focus tube to the sensor, and that's why I have this. Whoa, I don't want this thing to roll on me. That's why I can adjust this, because it moves the sensor up and down until I get to what? Focus. Which in other words, like we talked about on the whiteboard, I am simply making the image plane, or the focal plane, if you want to call it that, and the sensor coplanar. I'm putting them in the same identical position. I've got this, uh, I've got a dovetail down here that this thing is balanced on. I've got the uh, um, Celestron uh, Star Sense auto alignment scope there too as well. So that's what's causing this thing a little bit be a little bit off balance. So let's do this. I've got a tape measure here and I'm gonna have to set this down here. You get to stare at the side of the AAF while I extend this tape measure. But this is an 800 millimeter focal length. So the focal point is 800 millimeters from the tube, from the mirror, I'm sorry, which is 31 inches. So there's 31 inches. The main mirror, you can tell there's the screws for the mirror cells right there. So out here is where the focal point is. If we didn't have the secondary mirror there. So the light rays, the tip of the light cone is right there, about three and a half inches out the front of the telescope. But notice, where is our secondary mirror? We, we know it's going to be in line with the focus tube. So at about, we'll just say for easy math, 10 inches. So uh, that'd be 21 inches. So let's check this out. 21 yeah, about, heck, let's call it 23 again for easy math. So the distance from the primary mirror to the secondary is 23 inches. And we know 31 minus 23 is what? Eight. Is that right? Yeah. So we know that the focal point extends eight inches off of our secondary. How do I know where the secondary is? Well, there's my spider vein knob right there. So I'm going to start measuring there. And look at that. Eight inches is the focal point. And sure enough, it's where it exists well outside this focuser. In fact, if I rack this focuser tube all the way down, again, I like to start kind of at a baseline position. Come here and measure eight inches right there. Look how high the focal point is from the top of that focus tube. And we know the focal point and the, and the focal plane aren't the same. So there's a focal plane prior to the focal point, And there's a focal plane after the focal point. So it's interesting because that kind of makes sense. Because when I put this camera, this is a mirrorless Sony. That's a QX1. For those of you that have seen my imagery online, you'll see that this is the camera I use many, many, many times. When I put this thing in the focus tube... I'm going to secure it here just in case it gets crazy. That right there looks great. But notice my M, my sensor is about even with that alpha sign. And we know that the focal point was right about here. So I need to get that sensor down here to that first focal point, or I need to get it back here to the second focal point. Well, obviously I can't roll the focuser in more, so i got to roll this thing out to get the camera's sensor coplanar with the focal point, I'm sorry, the focal plane that exists after the focal point. But I can tell you right now, having used this setup many times, that even this right here isn't enough. That tells me that focal point 
I'm, yeah, I keep, sorry. That tells me that focal plane that exists beyond the focal point is way up here somewhere. So what I end up having to do for this camera, let me roll this down a little bit. Let me take this out. Is I have to use this focal tube extender. Now there's no glass. This is not a Barlow. It's just an extender. And I roll it down. Now I put the camera on here. I, don't you hate it when these things, I mean, you think you got them backed out all the way and your stuff still doesn't fit in there. There we go. Tighten that up just for security and I roll this out and it's about uh, three quarters of an inch and I typically have focus. But look how far back I had to roll this camera and mount it to the point after the focal point to get to that focal plane, to put the imager, the, um, I'm sorry, the, the sensor and the focal plane coplanar. So that is that. But that's with this camera. If I use like a dedicated astrophotography camera, like a planetary camera, and I've got one sitting over here. Again, don't you hate it when these things don't let go? Especially the Sony. When I use a dedicated astrophotography camera, like this planetary camera, this is an ASI 290. By the way, for planetary cameras, I don't think you can beat this. I think it's even better than the ASI 294, certainly better than the 120. Why? Because this just has an ungodly frame rate. I mean, on Mars, when it, at opposition, I was getting close to 420, 450 frames per second. Unbelievable. But anyway, obviously I would have a two inch to one and a quarter inch adapter, but this thing sits right here and it can go all the way in there. Look, I've lost my voice a little bit. Told you I'm under the weather, but it can go almost all the way in there and that achieves focus for this particular camera. And it has to do where the sensor is related to the camera body. But every camera is different. One of the things I want to show you, let me take the, and then, yeah, my voice is cracking. I told you I'm, I'm ill. Notice how on this camera, here's the camera body and there's the sensor right there. I mean, it's not, but what? Half an inch, maybe a third of an inch of even that inside the camera body. But I'm going to show you, and this is a mirrorless DSLR. There is no mirror. Now I'm going to show you a Canon 30D, which is right here. This is a mirrored DSLR. Light coming down the lens in the DSLR, a mirrored DSLR. Comes down the lens, enters the camera body, hits a mirror so that the light, when I'm looking at, is deflected through the eyepiece. And then when I click the shutter button and take a picture, you can hear the mirror flip. It exposes now the sensor to the incoming light, takes a picture, takes a picture, the mirror flips back down. But what's important to note about a mirrored DSLR is this. You can see the mirror right there. Behind the sensor, I'm sorry, behind this mirror is the sensor. And that's some distance. I don't know what it is. For the typical camera, it's about a half inch, maybe even less. But the problem is that may be just enough distance so that the camera body with the adapter on it, the two inch adapter, something like this would go on the front of your camera. The camera body plus that half inch distance from the mirror to the sensor may be just enough to prevent you from reaching focus. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. That is why most people, and I'm included in that gang, is if you haven't bought it, DSLR yet for astrophotography and you want to, I recommend getting a mirrorless DSLR so that you can take that distance from the mirror to the sensor out of the equation and you'll probably most likely have a better chance of achieving focus. Here is a two inch Barlow. In our discussion on the whiteboard, we talked about Barlow lenses being a solution to achieving focus. Again, don't you hate it when they don't let the hell go. There we go. So remember, Barlow's actually have glass in them. This is a 2X Barlow. It's got glass in it. Obviously, it fits in there like that. 
But this Barlow does two things for us. You can tell right off the get-go, it does what? Well, it physically extends the length of the focus tube. So if my sensor is here, but the focal plane's up here, I automatically am able to move my camera a little bit closer to the focal plane. And maybe all that's left is I need to rack the focuser out a little bit. But because there's glass in the Barlow, it also changes the shape <coughs> of the light cone. Therefore, it changes the position of the focal point and therefore changes the position of the focal plane and may be able to bring it from way out here to somewhere down here more reasonable to where I can now reach it with my sensor. So that's why Barlow's oftentimes are a common solution. So real quick, let's go back over to our, white, our whiteboard where I drew this to talk about what we just talked about over at the telescope. Here is a mirrored DSLR. Here's the mirror. Normally light comes down into the camera body. By the way, here's the camera body. That's the physical side, you know, front of the camera that prevents you from shoving the camera further into the optical tube assembly. The light strikes the mirror, comes up to the eyepiece, and you get to see what you're about to take a picture of. Take a picture, the mirror flips out of the way, the light now comes to the sensor. But this distance between the two may be just enough. Notice that the camera body to mirror length is shorter than the sensor to the camera body length. And that extra, that extra delta right there may be just enough that it's preventing you from reaching focus. That's why we, most folks, recommend a mirrorless DSLR. Notice for these two hypothetical cameras, I've got the camera body line the same, but notice how the sensor, instead of being here, is now closer to the front of the camera body because I don't have to worry about a mirror and all the mechanics behind flipping that thing back and forth. So a mirrorless DSLR is the rec at least I recommend, and most people will too as well, uh, the choice to go for a DSLR for astrophotography. Here's a crazy drawing of a Barlow. Here's our focuser tube. Here's our Barlow. Now remember there's glass in there, so it's gonna change the shape of the light cone so that we bring the focus plane from somewhere way out here closer to where it's reachable by the sensor on our camera, or even an eyepiece. You may have a, I don't know, a telescope that somebody did something weird to, and even with an eyepiece in the focuser tube, you can't see anything, but with a Barlow, you can. I wouldn't, this is a, a good solution, but it wouldn't be my first choice because Barlow lenses, they magnify the target, but we don't always want the targets to be magnified. magnified. If I have a flashlight giving out so much wattage being held two inches off a sheet of paper and I extend that distance to four inches, I have now cut the amount of energy per square inch by a fourth. It's called the inverse square law. And a Barlow kind of does the same thing. For any given target, I have doubled the magnification, but I have lessened the intensity per given unit area by the same amount. In other words, a dim galaxy through an eyepiece is going to look four times as, well, I'm sorry, half as dim, twice as dim, whatever term you want to use, when looking at it through a Barlow, which is why a lot of times you can't see your image targets, dim targets, when you use a Barlow. <coughs> and then lastly, here's the simple focus extender that I showed you with that Sony QX1. There's no glass, so it doesn't change the shape of the light cone, but normally my camera body, my two inch T adapter, only allows me to come out this far on the focus tube, but it doesn't get my focus, my sensor near the focal plane. But if I mount a focus extender now to my focus tube, I can now bring my camera way back here and I can better possibly align my sensor with the focal plane. And that's why that solution works. So, now we've talked about the physics, the optics, what's happening mechanically with my telescope and with my focuser, with my focus extension, with my Barlow lens, etc. Now, how do I achieve focus? Because that's really why you're here. And I'm going to explain this quickly before I lose my voice. I told you I am well under the weather and the more I talk, the worse it gets. So I don't have my finder scope mounted to this tube right now but pretend we do. So 
If you plan on bringing your telescope outside at night with your family, maybe it was a Christmas gift, you just got it, the kids are excited, you're excited, all your neighbors are coming over, aunts and uncles, grandma's flying to town, etc. And you're going to bring this thing out and then it doesn't achieve focus. That wouldn't be cool. So I recommend the weekend prior, at least a few days prior, so that you can do this a couple times if necessary before the big night, is you bring the thing outside during the day. And find something that's a long ways away. Generally speaking, at least a kilometer to a mile or further if you can. And that something has to be discernible, like a cell phone tower. That you, when you look at it, either through the finder scope or in your eyepiece and your telescope, you indeed can tell that that is the cell phone tower you intend to look at. Don't pick a tree that's in a forest line on a mountain range eight miles away. Because you're not going to know which tree you're looking at. Because the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to align the axis of the finder scope with the axis of the telescope. So find something out there. About a mile and a half, mile or so from my house, there's these 300,000 volt power lines on the big towers. And the top of them have a the little flashy light. And that's what I use. And the reason why we want something at range, in other words, a long ways away, is because at about that range for most telescopes, about a mile and a half to a mile or so, Anything beyond that range is going to have about the same identical focal plane to include Vega at 26 light years, to include Orion Nebula at 1500 light years. <clears throat> so that's why we want to pick something that's a ways away. Because we want that range to be at, generally speaking, infinity. In other words, the focal plane for anything at that range and beyond is identical. So, slew your telescope or push it, however you move your scope, so that you see it in your finder scope. And put it in your finder scope's crosshairs. Then grab an eyepiece. Now, you probably have more than one, most likely, and they're going to have numbers on them. Pick, like, for example, here I've got 42 millimeter, and I've got 35. Pick the eyepiece with the larger number. This eyepiece is going to ha not have near the magnification as a smaller number, and it's going to have a wider field of view because I want to be able to look through this and see the damn cell phone tower or whatever it is you're trying to find. So look through here, and hopefully your cell phone tower is somewhere in the field of view of your eyepiece. If it's not, here's what you can do. Suppose this is the tip of your tower, and you're looking at the very top. What I want you to do is, this is looking through the finder scope, is... Move your telescope down. So, by the way, it's a blister if you're wondering what kind of weird disease I have. Move your telescope down so that the tower or whatever you're looking at, you're not just looking at the tip, but you're looking at the tower itself. So that if I go left and right with the scope, that tower will move across the field of view of the telescope. So go from the tip somewhere down on the length of the tower itself. Then while looking through the eyepiece, Move your telescope back and forth until you see the tower come in field of view of your eyepiece in the middle. And center it in your eyepiece and lock it there. Lock your telescope, lock your mount, engage the clutches, however your mount's designed, so that your telescope doesn't move. Now that you've found the tower in your finder scope, <clears throat> because remember we have it centered, not the tip of the tower, but the 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 tube, the, the shaft, whatever you want to call it, of the tower itself. And then we want to find it in the finder scope and adjust your finder scope left, right, using the adjustment knobs on the finder scope so that that tower is on your crosshairs or at least in the center of the field of view of your finder scope, just like so. Then go back to your eyepiece and make sure it hasn't moved too much uh, left or right in the field of view of your eyepiece. Now, if it's moved a little bit because the scope moved a little bit, that's okay. We'll fine-tune that at the next step. So then go back to your eyepiece, center up the tower again, and now slew straight up, not left or right, but straight up so that the tip of the tower is centered in the eyepiece, as close as possible. It's centered up in the, eye, in the field of view. And then go to your finder, and it should look something like this. It won't quite be there, or it'll be too much. But at least it should be lined up left and right, right? Because we've already made that adjustment. So then just adjust your finder scope in the vertical so that 
the tip of the tower is now in your finder scope. Now you'll probably find now that when you look through the eyepiece, there's been some shifting. Maybe it's like that. So center up the eyepiece, because remember, I'm sorry, center up the tower, the tip of the tower in the telescope, because that's what we're really wanting to do, right? Is get this telescope lined up. Then go back to the eyepiece over here. I'm sorry, the, um, the finder scope. And it's probably going to be a little bit off. So again, adjust with the knobs to bring it over here. Go back to the eyepiece. Every time you adjust with the knobs, your telescope moves a little bit. So you'll probably find that that tip of the tower has shifted a little bit. So again, move the telescope so that the tip of the tower is recentered in your eyepiece field of view. Then go back to the finder scope. You'll probably find that there will be a little bit of adjustment needed. And literally, you go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until... What's centered exactly in the eyepiece is centered exactly in the finder scope. Now you may have, I do it anyway, I don't have a two inch, one and a quarter adapter here with me, but I have a one and a quarter inch um, illuminated reticle with the double crosshairs that lights up at night. You know, it's got battery power and all that. So once you narrow it and center it up with this wider, field of view eyepiece, in other words, the eyepiece with this larger number, you could take this out and now put in a much higher magnification eyepiece in here. In other words, an eyepiece with a smaller number, and then repeat that process going back and forth. And what you're doing, you're refining, you're minimizing, narrowing the delta between the two as much as possible. And by the way, the axes of your the axis of your optical tube and the finder scope are different, right? But if I pick a target that is at least out there at infinity, then the difference in these axes won't make a difference, if that makes sense. So that's another reason why we want to pick something out at range. So now that we have our finder scope and our telescope in alignment, I can now ask myself, <coughs> does my telescope tube with the eyepieces I have, are they able to achieve focus? So looking at the same target, heck, I'd, I'd pick the same uh, tower or test your alignment. You just spent 15 minutes doing this. Slew to another tower if it's a series of power lines or slew to a tree that you can see on a ridge line out there or the tip of a mountain or something like that. Looking through the viewfinder, center it up. It should be centered here. If so, great. If not, go back and repeat the process we talked about. But now, let's ask ourselves, once we're centered up on our target, let's roll this focuser tube all the way in. We call that racking it all the way in. Let's put in an eyepiece. Let's lock that thing in. Then while looking through the eyepiece, let's just start rolling this thing out. And if the image is getting clearer, 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 and all of a sudden I'm at focus, boom, you're good to go. You can achieve focus. We could take this eyepiece out, put in another eyepiece, put that in. Most likely it will be out of focus. And we can rack the focuser in. It's getting uglier, so we know we're going the wrong direction. Let's go the other way. And bam, we've achieved focus. Now, what happens if we've racked the focuser all the way out? We have our eyepiece in and we still cannot achieve focus. Here's what I do. I start rolling it in and I ask myself, is the image getting prettier or uglier? Well, if it's getting prettier, then we know we're rolling it in the right direction. And if we keep rolling, keep rolling, it's getting prettier and prettier, but all of a sudden, bam, we're up against the stops and I didn't quite get to focus. That tells me that this eyepiece needs to be even further down inside the focus tube, inside the OTA or the focus tube, to reach that optimal position for this particular eyepiece. Now remember, I could take this eyepiece and swap it for another one and be in perfectly good focus. So it's tube dependent and eyepiece dependent. That combination of the two is what's determining whether or not you can achieve focus. Suppose I've got this eyepiece in here and I'm rolling it all the way out the image is ugly right now. I'm rolling it out. It's getting prettier. It's getting prettier. It's getting prettier. Oh, almost there. Almost there. Almost there. Not quite. And all of a sudden, my focus tube doesn't move anymore. I have just reached, reached the maximum travel. 
of this focus tube, but I'm not at focus yet. Well, while looking through the eyepiece, loosen that up and take your eyepiece and just start to float it out while looking in the eyepiece. And you'll probably find that the image is not only getting prettier, but it may get perfect. And that tells you that focus for this eyepiece is somewhere out here. So how do we fix that? With the focus tube extender. Throw that on there. Now our eyepiece goes in there. But how did we know that? Well, we figured that out because we floated the eyepiece out of the focus tube until we achieved focus. Now we know the optimal position is somewhere out here like that. So we get an extender, lock it in place. Now our eyepiece goes in there, just like so. So let's talk about cameras real quick. Let's again roll this thing down to some mid-range position. Let's throw in the good old, ah, I took the two inch uh, T adapter off real quick. I've got my Sony QX1, I'm gonna put the T adapter back on. I'm gonna throw it in the focuser. Bam. So there's the Sony QX1. <clears throat> and I can't achieve focus. This thing has a live preview and you run it through your smart device, so your tablet, your iPad, or your iPhone. So I'm looking at my, I, my uh, iPad in real-time preview and I'm not in focus. So I start rolling it in and the focus is getting worse. So I know I'm going in the wrong direction. So I start to roll it out and oh, it's getting better, it's getting better, it's getting better. I'm getting my image, my sensor closer to the focal plane, getting closer, getting looking better, getting better. And then I get to here, boom, no joy. It's not in focus and I can't come out anymore. So while looking at my smart device, I get the camera and I can literally just float this thing up and go bam, whoa, I'm in perfect focus right there. So the optimum position for this thing is somewhere out here. So sure enough, same thing, I need my focus extender. So what I'm trying to tell you when you can't achieve focus, first of all, you gotta do a finder scope alignment so that you can adequately target something out at infinity during the daytime, find the sweet focus spot for every one of your devices. For your mirrorless DSLR, there will be a given position and a given combination of equipment. For example, this extension tube that I'm going to need. For a mirrored DSLR, there's going to be a given position and some, you know, a barlow or maybe extension or maybe nothing at all to get that camera's sensor coat planer with the focal plane of this tube. Maybe with my planetary, I don't need anything. I just drop the sucker in there with a two inch to one and a quarter inch adapter and bam, right off the get go, I have put this sensor coplanar with the focal plane of this particular telescope. And lastly, I may need a Barlow. Remember Barlow not only gives us extension, but it also has glass in it, which changes the shape of the light cone, which in turn changes the physical position of the focal plane and whatever position that is, it may be easier for me to achieve or get to that same position with my sensor on the camera when I use a Barlow. Not, that is not my first choice. I would rather go with a focal extender, but sometimes the combination of extension and light cone adjustment is what a lot of people need sometimes. And that's why for some people, a Barlow is their only option. And then there's, one final option here that I'll talk about, if you've tried all these different things and can't achieve focus. Remember, normally an eight inch telescope is gonna have a longer tube. So just picture this tube being somewhere over here. So the focal point for this mirror is 800 millimeters, 31 inches. And we already said that it's right about here earlier in the video. But if we have a normal eight inch tube, like an eight inch Dobson, Dobsonian, the mirror is going to be here. That means the focal point's actually going to be somewhere around here. And of course, our diagonal, our secondary mirror is there. So it's bending the light cone. So that focal point's going to be way down inside there. So the first focal plane prior to the focal point is going to be even further down in there. And the focal plane after the focal point is going to be somewhere up in here. But it still may be the hell way down in there. 
So how can I extend that light cone and the focal point and two focal planes further up out of my focuser tube so I can get to it with the sensor on my camera? Well, we move the mirror up because what we're doing, we're taking that whole light cone and shifting it forward, which means take into account the secondary mirror, we're pushing the light cone further up into the focus tube. So that's why a lot of solutions you'll see posted online, and I have a good friend of mine that's done this with one of his telescopes. He did it with a five inch Newtonium. By the way, we took a picture of the Flame Nebula and Orion Nebula, I'm sorry, Flame Nebula and Horsehead together with this camera just in his experiment. I think we only did 20 subs at five seconds each on a five inch mirror. <clears throat> it was unbelievable. But he moved the mirror up to be able to achieve focus with that camera. So that's why sometimes online people will say, oh, you need to mirror, move the mirror up to make that happen. How much do I need to move the mirror? Well, it, you're going to have to kind of guess. Um, the, someone out there smarter than me has probably figured that out. But you can take, if you shine your telescope at the moon, hold a white sheet of paper, cardboard or something, you can actually see a circle of light on the sheet of paper. And as you move that paper closer and closer and closer to the focus tube, the circle of light gets smaller and smaller and smaller, which means you're getting closer and closer to the focal point, which means you're getting closer and closer to the focal plane. You could also take that sheet of paper and hold it in here above the secondary, and you'll see that same effect. And you can move that paper closer to the secondary or further out, and you can see whether or not that light cone is getting larger and larger or smaller and smaller, and that will help you determine where the focal point is, hence where the focal plane is. And if you need to move it to somewhere right around here in this range so you can get to it just by simply racking your focuser in and out, then whatever that distance is, is the amount of distance that you need to move your mirror, if that makes sense. And those people, and I have not done this. I have a good friend that has, and he will, I kind of went through the process with him remotely. Uh, so it is very doable, and it's it's a very easy thing to do, actually to be honest, but uh, but that is a solution. I would much rather attempt, you know, one of these solutions, extension, maybe Barlow, you know, if that'll work, but remember Barlow's got glass, so it will affect your imagery. And maybe it's time to invest from a mirrored DSLR to a mirrorless DSLR, because maybe that half inch distance between the mirror and the sensor is all I need to fix this problem. Well, folks, that's it. I'm sorry again for the hundredth time. I'll tell you, I was under the weather, so my voice is cracking. It's hoarse. It hurts right now. I apologize, but I didn't want to wait any longer to get this video out because I just see this question posed so many times, and I do not want someone to get out there and be discouraged. But remember, after you've done all this stuff we talked about several days prior, now this thing is dialed in. It's tuned in. It's ready to rock. So when you break it out at night with your family, everyone's excited for their first look through a telescope at the moon and the Orion Nebula, and you can see the rings of Saturn and the Galilean moons of Jupiter, you won't have to fumble through this while everyone's standing around outside in the cold getting bored. And by the way, for people who are not into astronomy, if you don't hook them fast, in other words, if you're out there fumbling with your equipment for 15, 20 minutes while they're standing there, they're going to be very, uh, it won't be as climactic uh, when they take a peek at Jupiter. Right, you want to be able to come out and go, oh, cool, you know, and get hooked right then. So, you know the deal. So, I hope you've enjoyed this. If you did, click like. And I, as you've heard me say before in other videos, we all should always be in the business of learnings, and I am no exception. So, there are some of you out there a hundred times smarter than me. Actually, there are many, 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 many of you. Please leave a comment. If you got questions, leave it. If this works for you and you liked it, I love hearing the feedback. I got an unbelievable comment about my wireless control of a telescope and the mount. Just the other day, the individual was about to toss everything away, get rid of it, but he got it all to work. And, and I, man, it made my day. This was literally just yesterday. So I encourage you to leave comments. If you like it, click like. If you like this channel, if you find this informational, uh, hit subscribe. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm always looking for feedback. You guys have a great uh, new year, 2022. Ciao.